You're listening to the Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host from New York City, Ankit Panda, an editor at large at The Diplomat and a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm pleased today on the podcast to be joined by a name who should be familiar to many of you. Uh, joining me today is Robert Farley. Uh, Rob, of course, is a longstanding contributor to the Diplomats Flashpoints channel, where he covers everything from military technology and intellectual property, which also happens to be the topic of his new book coming out in a few months, I believe. Uh, this is a book that he's co-authored with David Isaacs. The book is called Patents for Power, Intellectual Property, and the Diffusion of Military Technology, published by University of Chicago Press. Rob, thanks for joining me on the show again. Thanks for having me. It's always a delight to be here. Yeah, and I'm always very happy to have you on. Uh, so Patents for Power. Uh, this is an interesting book. Uh, it takes a look directly at the relationship between intellectual property law and the military industrial complex and uh, and uh, basically how countries choose to procure certain technologies before we get into the arguments that you make and talk a little bit about intellectual property in today's context of i guess great power competition between the united states and china and a few other issues i want to ask you a bit about how this book came about because you know i've had you on the show before to talk about everything from battleships to uh, you know u.s china relations i'm wondering what took your interests towards intellectual property and specifically intellectual property as it relates to military technology. Sure. So uh, my co-author uh, is uh, an intellectual property uh, attorney um, and was a, a law professor specializing in intellectual property. Um, and you know, I myself uh, studied military technology and especially the diffusion of military technology. Um, and we got together and wh what we found when we got together was that there was uh, much more intersection between um, these questions of intellectual property and uh, military technology than we had suspected. Um, so we put together a short piece um, that detailed some of the stuff that went on um, with respect to contracting in the United States, um, how patents mattered, how intellectual property mattered for uh, the U.S. acquiring military technology. And what we found was that there was there was really a, a lot of ferment um, that uh, the Department of Defense was thinking a lot about how it acquired intellectual property, what it wanted when it um, uh, when it started um, to uh, make contracts with private firms. Um, and we found out that there was actually quite a bit of history to it as well, um, that uh, states have for a pretty long time been worried about this intersection between, um, you know, what intellectual property protection is going to look like and their own defense and national security. So from fairly humble beginnings and um, from beginnings that seemed very unexpected, um, uh, it turned out that there was a little bit of a research agenda here with respect to how intellectual property law, both on the domestic side and on the international side, um, was affecting how military technology got developed, and then on down the line, how that military technology diffused across the international system. Right. So let me just ask you, you know, a really fundamental question here. So, you know, I think intuitively it's it's easy to sort of appreciate why intellectual property matters in, let's say, the private sector. Right. If you're a company or a you know pharmaceutical firm and you develop some drug or you develop some product that, uh, you know, leverages some kind of significant innovation, intellectual property laws basically exist to allow you to profit from that and create incentives for further innovation. Um, of course, in the defense realm. Innovation is important uh, and has been important for really centuries. Um, and, you know, in the, in the context today, why does intellectual property law specifically matter and why does it merit sort of specific analysis when it comes to defense? What are the what are the unique characteristics when we talk about intellectual property law and defense technology? Well, there there are a few different ways in which you have this sort of really in, in interesting and unique intersection between uh, intellectual property law um, and national defense. And I'm going to riff here off of um, a work which is not my own, but I always recommend it, which is uh, Catherine Epstein's Torpedo. Um, and in that book, um, she makes the argument that modern intellectual property law and the military industrial complex basically come out of the same place. Um, that they have a, a, you know, effectively the same source and that what we think of as a modern defense industrial base, especially in the West, but increasingly also um, in uh, China, in Russia and so forth, um, is because uh, you have to have some sort of relationship between your defense producer and the state. Um, in the 19th century, very often that was something that was straight off the shelf, right? So we have stories of how 
people would bring their inventions to Lincoln um, in the uh, White House and you know try to show him some sort of machine gun or something like that. Um, they would have patents on it. They would have certain kinds of patent protection for it, um, but they would essentially develop it on their own, and then the government would decide whether or not um, it wanted to buy. Um, what Epstein details and what we found in other areas is that by the turn of the century, military technology had become so expensive um, that it was very difficult for uh, that sort of relationship to work, right? That, that essentially what you needed um, was some kind of upfront investment on the part of the state um, in order to generate military technological innovation. Um, and so when you have uh, that kind of relationship, the question then immediately becomes where you have a private firm and Lockheed Martin does not come along until later, but let's pre pre pretend you have a private firm that wants some ownership of the technology that's developing. At the same time, you have state investment, um, and so the U.S. government wants some sort of ownership of the technology that's being developed. And so what you then have is a sophisticated body of law that emerges that gives both the government and private actors certain rights over the things that are being invented, right, over the uh, ability to reproduce, the ability to license, the ability to sell certain kinds of technologies, um, and that basically IP law governs those relationships, right? So it governs mm -hmm. a set of relationships between a modern DIB defense industrial base and a modern state. And so that's kind of at the core of you know, what we're looking at and what we're thinking about when we're thinking about how intellectual property is affecting defense production, defense innovation, and so forth, right? That it, that it manages that relationship between private actors and the state. Right. And, you know, um, thinking a little bit in an international context, um, so what you just described, uh, I think, was a terrific compressed overview of how things work in the United States. Um, but of course, you know, defense innovation, while obviously the United States is a, is a leader in many ways, happens around the world and different countries have different industrial bases. And you talk a little bit about the Soviet Union and sort of the different ways in which the Soviets did things. You want to tell our listeners a little bit about how intellectual property law, insofar as it relates to defense, has varied uh, internationally over the years? Yeah, so we took a look at um, uh, fairly brief looks, but but looks we took a look at Russia, we took a look at China, and then a little bit of a briefer look at South Korea, um, and they're really quite different. Um, and I, I think we were both surprised when you know we started researching the Soviet intellectual property protection system um, first to discover that there was a Soviet intellectual property protection system. Um, uh, it, it was it was I would not have been surprised to find out that the Soviets did not have any patent system at all. But um, in fact, they had an intellectual property system that was left over from uh, Imperial Russia um, that was basically in accordance with most of the rules that most of the rules of the road that most countries had set about how patents and trade secrets are supposed to work. Um, before the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and that system essentially continued to exist with a few fits and starts for most of the existence of the Soviet Union. Um, now, patents played a much different role in the Soviet defense industrial base than they do in the US. Um, patents were largely about the rights and the prestige of um, certain kinds of firms, design bureaus, production uh, facilities within the Soviet system, right? So they would strive to um, patent as many things as they could, which would then give them additional leverage and influence within the defense industrial base of the Soviet Union, right? Would allow them to protect certain kinds of production lines and so forth. So patents were something that they really sought, and patents did Try, in a sense, produce certain kinds of innovation in the Soviet system, but they didn't work the same way as they do in the West, which is, you know, to protect certain monopoly rights that a design bureau or a firm or something like that has. Um, and one thing we found was that, I mean, the Soviets literally tried to patent everything, right? They were patent, they were producing all kinds of patents, you know, way in excess of what you would find in the West, but the patents, you know, weren't very useful. They weren't necessarily mm -hmm. indicative of a lot of actual innovation. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese, fascinatingly, um, of course, did not have any of that heritage of an intellectual property system. Um, nationalist China did really, I mean, it had, it had signed a few of the treaties, but, but the communists completely ignored those. Um, and especially on the conventional side, and the work of Taiming Chung uh, on this is really valuable, um, 
the the Chinese really tried to pursue technological innovation um, in the complete absence of a system of patent protection, a system of trade secret protection, um, anything along those lines. Um, and it ended up that it was disastrous, right? I mean, fundamentally, fundamentally, what a patent does is it allows you to share something that you have created with someone else without fear of losing your rights over it, right? Um, and what they found in the Chinese system in the 1960s and the 1970s was that the complete lack of any ability to protect innovations was disastrous for the innovation process because you had different bureaus, different labs, different firms that would invent things but then never share them, right? And so never enable any kind of productive process um, of uh, sort of additive innovation to happen between different individuals, different firms, and different bureaus. And so the Chinese system, especially even in the defense industrial base, became much more conventional um, along uh, around the time of sort of the major Deng Xiaoping reforms. Um, but the intention was not necessarily to bring it to international standards. It was to solve the problem of innovation in China, which was a significant issue after the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the one of the other things, I mean, just in the context of defense technologies, um, you know, just zooming out a little bit from the intellectual property discussion, um, obviously, exclusivity has its values, right? When you develop a technology, you develop it presumably because it's going to give you some advantage, and that's why governments want to procure certain capabilities, and that's a big part of current discussions here in the United States over over a variety over a variety of technologies, and has been that way over the years. Uh, you know, stealth aircraft, um, bombers, um, submarines, what have you. Um, obviously, that's been also a major problem because adversaries don't want you to have exclusivity. And uh, this is where we get into hairy issues like intellectual property theft, which, as I'm sure many of our listeners are aware, is a major ongoing source of tension between the United States and China. Of course, what isn't these days? Um, mm -hmm. What did you So you know, I know I know this is something you address in the book. And, and there's a and there's a whole chapter uh, devoted to cyber espionage in particular, which is a, uh, a whole nother can of worms. But what were some of the surprising findings you came across over the process of writing this as to, um, you know, the limitations, first of all, to uh, intellectual property theft, uh, um, I guess, historically and, and today? And also, I mean, why states choose to make investments in stealing intellectual property instead of, you know, devoting more to uh, fostering indigenous innovation? Yeah, I mean, so... The intellectual property theft question is a really, really interesting one um, because there really are some fantastic examples of spectacularly successful um, thefts of foreign intellectual property in the defense sphere. Um, you know, one of these that we talk about in the book is um, the uh, the very early Soviet bomber Tu-4, um, which is essentially a copy of the B-29, right? They just sort of literally copied, reverse engineered, took apart B-29s that um, they had, that had landed in, uh, in the Soviet Union, um, and uh, that they didn't simply took apart and completely rebuilt, um, and uh, then made copies that were essentially very, very similar, right? Um, this clearly was a violation of certain rights of the Boeing Corporation. Um, uh, and you would expect, I mean, there is no way to punish the Soviets for that, but it was a spectacularly successful example of stealing intellectual property. Another example that we talk about a um, little bit is the, uh, the AK-47 assault rifle, um, where essentially uh, uh, the Soviets uh, lack any ability to um, protect the firm's rights to and their intellectual property rights of the rifle, and it gets built everywhere by everybody. Um, and so you have, you know, 100 million examples of it out across the world, in part because the Soviets can never really protect. Um, but you know, one of the other things we found, um, and uh, this is in accord with with the work of uh, Andrea and and Mauro Gili, um, who we talked, who I think you did a podcast with, and who um, we did a series on in in the magazine, um, that uh, reverse engineering stuff is really really hard, right? And as technological complexity uh, increases, it becomes uh, even harder. Um, and so when we see, say, the Chinese um, steal intellectual property, defense-related intellectual property from the United States, um, there is certainly theft going on, and it's certainly defense-related. Um, but it's not enough that the Chinese simply get a hold of certain kinds of packets you know, patents, state secret protected patents, um, or trade secrets, um, that they have to have a process of 
assembling those together, of fitting them into their own industrial system, of generating the human capital that can take advantage um, of uh, of those kinds of secrets, of figuring out then um, you know how say stealth and certain kinds of stealth uh, items are going to work um, in terms of the fighters that they're producing, which are you know being produced for different reasons and with different capabilities than ours, um, and so. To an extent, the kind of intellectual property theft that um, uh, people are talking about a lot right now between the U.S. and China probably matters more on the civilian side than it matters on the military side mm. because the military technology is so complex um, that it's hard to really sort of take and replicate a modern weapon system, right? Like an F-35. It's a, it's, a, it's a ridiculously difficult thing to do, even if you have a direct line to Lockheed Martin. Right. I think a good example of that in the Chinese case is their inability to really master um, advanced or high-performance jet engines. They haven't been able to do right. that particularly well. Right, right, right. Exactly. That I mean, and, and the Soviets do all sorts of, or the, not the Soviets, but the Soviets did, and the Russians do all sorts of licensing um, and transfers of human capital and technology transfer. But you still don't get the same kind of engines coming out of Chinese factories as you do out of Russian factories. And that's something that's actually pretty common in supply chains around the world, right? That there are just some social systems that are not as functional in terms of producing the kind of technology you want, no matter what the intellectual property rights look like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's that's actually a fascinating distinction because a lot of the uh, a lot of the Trump administration's um, you know anxieties over intellectual property theft uh, do relate to civilian technologies. And of course, there is a lot of conflation, right? Because uh, you know you'll hear um, folks talk about China's military civil fusion strategy where. You know, companies like Huawei, uh, you know, are presumably setting up infrastructure in various countries that could be leveraged by the Ministry of State Security or or, or Chinese state interests or the PLA. Um, you know, a lot of this does remain classified, so it's not well understood publicly. But I mean, is this is this more of an issue just given the inherent directions in which military technologies have gone over the last 20, 25 years as the internet and, and network communications have just proliferated among civilians as well. I mean, is the, is the nature of this conversation substantively changing because of the growing um, complexity of um, not only civilian infrastructure and, and telecommunications, but just the changing nature of military technology as well? Yeah, I mean, it, well, I think we should pause here for a second. Um, because uh, the Trump administration is not the first U.S. administration to be really seriously worried about intellectual property. Um, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and the Obama administration you know, made intellectual property protection you know, almost at the core of U.S. trade strategy um, over the past 20 years, right? Because of a you know a developing understanding of what the United States does um, as an industrial power, right? It's not that it the, it's not that the United States produces stuff, although it does, right? It's that the United States produces really, really interesting technology that makes it indispensable. Um, and so all of the trade agreements, even on the civilian side that we have, um, you know, back for the past 20 years, have all had huge elements of intellectual property protection to them, right? And, you know, as you know, this was at the core of the TPP as well, right? The TPP was an effort to basically bring the Asia Pacific into compliance with U.S. intellectual property law um, in a way that would sort of really edge out the Chinese, right? Um, and so, you know, countries like Vietnam and so forth, right? You would create sort of arbitration standards and other things that would make would, would effectively make U.S. intellectual property law enforceable in those countries. Um, so. You know, it's not just the Trump administration, although the the, the complaints have grown louder um, in the Trump administration. But, you know, certainly the digital technology issue is one that's, that's really, really interesting um, and really, really complex. And I think, you know, if you were to ask the Geelys, right, I think they would say that, you know, the modern communications infrastructure is representative of an incredibly complicated economy. Um, and, you know, just because, again, you can you can sneak in and steal the files and really everything about an F-35 doesn't mean you can make it. Um, but I think that the digitization of knowledge has changed things in other ways, right? I think that it's changed how the defense industrial base works. Um, it has helped generated this system where um, the major defense giants are, you know, effectively systems aggregators rather than producers. Um, <clears throat> and 
sort of in the context of the United States, what that has meant is that, you know, certain bits of knowledge um, and the ownership of certain bits of knowledge are shared across a bunch of different actors, right? The Defense Department of Defense has something, the Air Force has something, Lockheed Martin has something, Raytheon, which makes a component, has something, the plethora of subcontractors that Raytheon and Lockheed Martin all have to have bits of knowledge and bits of ownership over this property. And even more than that, every single one of those firms and the U.S. government are represented by legal counsel, right? So they're represented by law firms, which also have bits and pieces of this knowledge. Um, and so what that means is that when you're talking, for example, about trade secrets, which is basically the responsibility of the company to protect, um, the surface area for an attacker is gigantic, Right? right, because they can attack anywhere. I mean, we, we we do have evidence that U.S. law firms that represent, you know, parts of the defense industrial base come under attack from Chinese hackers because they had the least capable defenses of anyone in that chain. So it's a really there's lots of really interesting implications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I mean, you know, what is the recommendation there? Should the burden on protecting those firms, particularly ones that have highly sensitive information that may or may not be of interest to the military industrial complex directly. Should the burden there then be distributed? Should government play a role in protecting those firms? You know, I, I mean, the, 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 con the conversations really on this, that kind of question really go back and forth, forth, right? You know, what is the responsibility of the firm? What is the responsibility of the state? What is the responsibility of the federal government? You know, I think in terms of defense technology, when stuff is, you know, literally being stolen for national security reasons, the federal government really has to take the lead, right? I mean, that doesn't mean that, you know, every single part of that chain can be completely reliant on the federal government, but the federal government has to, you know, be the one that is there um, maintaining rules of effectively of cyber hygiene um, for all of these firms, right? They, 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 it can't be left to the individual firms because they have an incentive to shirk. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there has to be federal leadership and that, that comes in places like um, uh, it has to come in the military, Department of Defense, you know, Department of Justice, um, about how exactly firms that want to do business with the U.S. government have to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, intellectual property in defense, is this is this a vulnerability that's particularly unique to the United States? I mean, other companies, uh, other countries obviously have firms that, that develop certain technologies, but by and large, the U.S. is recognized as an innovator along several lines, right? Part of the reason DOD is um, pushing ahead with the third offset and um, and things like that. But, you know, is there is there um, is there sort of scope for this to potentially be applied by the United States to other countries? I mean, I mean, does the United States ever potentially, um, you know, will the United States be in a position where it might seek to, let's say, procure intellectual property from other countries through uh, means that may not be particularly transparent? Yeah, so I mean, that's that's two questions, and I'll ask the uh, I'll ask the first or I'll answer the first one first. Um, yeah, the United States is particularly vulnerable just because of the way we structure our defense industrial base, right? Where it's built around a bunch of big but private, um, uh, you know, privately owned uh, companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and so forth. We had a conversation with a with an aerospace exec. It didn't make it into the book, but it was interesting. Um, who was complaining about the Department of Defense wanting to buy up all the intellectual property. And he, then he said something, uh, it was something along the lines of, in Europe, this is never a problem, right? They don't care about it in Europe. Well, they don't care about it in Europe because they have a fundamentally different relationship between, you know, if not state-owned, then largely state-controlled state defense producers, right? That's not the kind of defense industrial base we have in the United States. It's more adversarial, which is why you need an intellectual property law, which is why there's a particular vulnerability. Um, and to answer the second part, which is, is it worthwhile for us to think about reaching out and touching someone? I mean, well, of course we do, right? Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting that, you know, a lot of the, um, the movies that we have about espionage um, are about the United States going and stealing something, right? You know, my, so a couple of my favorite movies, um, Firefox with Clint Eastwood, Hunt for Red October, these are about Americans going and stealing intellectual property from other countries, right? Stealing intellectual property from the Soviet Union. And you can say Red October, like the tree, they're giving it to us. But Firefox, he's just going there to steal that fighter because it's better. Um, and you know, we do distinguish 
right? We, we distinguish very carefully, the Department of Justice distinguishes very carefully in saying that a certain kind of spying, right, if we want to go in and steal everything there is about the J-20, that's fine, as long as we don't turn around and hand that information to Lockheed Martin and ask them to build us a J-20, right? Um, because that way, we're not stealing for profit from a foreign corporation, right? Say that, um, and that's what's different, right? That, that if China and the Chinese intelligence services steal something about the F-35 and then try to incorporate something about the F-35 into, say, the J-31 and then try to export the J-31, right? That's not about national security anymore. That's just about stealing, right? Mm -hmm. And so we distinguish between those two kinds of things, like that certain kinds of intelligence gathering about foreign technology are fine, but going out and stealing stuff and then reproducing it at home, that's a little bit different. Right, yeah, and I think, um, you know, we've even done that in the case of uh, information breaches like the OPM breach and things like that. I think it was um, Michael Hayden, I think he did an interview where he basically said, look, I mean, when I was at the NSA, this is something we totally would have done. And, right, and the right. Chinese did it, and it's, and it's legitimate. Oh, no, that's very interesting. I mean, particularly, uh, I guess I hadn't thought about the hunt for Red October in those terms, but yeah, that very much makes a lot of sense. Uh, so one last question. This is, you know, a little bit, uh, I guess, newsier than uh, the other things we've been talking about and, and really on our Asia beat. Um, so, you know, I had a peek recently at the upcoming um, midterm UN panel of experts report on North Korea. And one of the big findings that's, um, I guess, new this year, or probably not new, but but receives some significant billing, is this idea that um, APTs linked to North Korea advance persistent threats in the, in the cyber world, uh, particularly the Lazarus Group. Um, they have actively been targeting aerospace and defense firms around the world in a, in a new campaign that began earlier this year. And, uh, of course, just today... Uh, Wednesday, August 12th, um, we saw some news from Israel that the Israelis claim to have thwarted uh, just such an attempt by Lazarus Group to um, to steal intellectual property from them. So, you know, North Korea is interesting because it's not really, I mean, thought of as a heavyweight in the intellectual property theft game, right? But it absolutely is. I mean, uh, you talk about this in the book, but the North Koreans and the Iranians and many of these other countries, um, you know, pursued um, various means of procuring intellectual property illicitly to support their ballistic missile programs and nuclear programs. How do you how do you think about the scope for smaller states and states with fewer resources? Um, isn't isn't intellectual property theft just a just a highly uh, asymmetric and profitable way for them to go about innovating? You know, it's a really, really interesting question, um, and you're obviously more of an expert than I on this, right? But the way that we've been thinking about about what North Korea has been doing for the past 30 years is that they recognize they cannot win the conventional arms race, um, and the only way, really, to ensure the survival of the regime is, regime is the development of nuclear weapons. Um, and so they basically give up on the conventional arms race. Um, and so, you know, the, the notice that they're, they are stealing stuff, um, in, you know, especially from, you know, advanced defense aerospace firms and so forth, is really interesting to me. Um, because I just don't, I just do not foresee a future in which North Korea is, no matter how, I mean, we could just give them an F-35 and give them all the specs associated with an F-35, and it's still going to take four decades before they can build one, hmm. um, just because of the way their industry is set up. Um, and so th this news is really, really interesting to me because, you know, I would expect that they would maybe, you know, if they're trying to improve their aerospace industry, you know, maybe for the export market or something like that, then something like this might be useful, but then really cutting edge stuff is not gonna be useful for them. Um, and on the other hand, I'm wondering, well, how much of a pass through is this, right? I mean, maybe maybe what they're finding is not that they can steal stuff and then use it to sort of rejuvenate their aerospace sector, but instead, simply the information itself is really super valuable. Um, and so whatever they acquire, we'll find a ready buyer in Moscow, we'll find a ready buyer in Beijing or somewhere else. Um, I don't really know, I mean, it's, but it's a really interesting question because um, it's not how I would, their aerospace industry is so far behind that I don't see what stealing advanced secrets from the West and Europe and Japan is really gonna help them do.
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I have some thoughts on that, but I'm going to I'm going to leave that for a separate podcast. But, um, okay. Rob, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. But, uh, you know, I really wanted to thank you for coming on. Uh, before we close, though, I wanted to, you know, just give you an opportunity to really just punch up the one big idea that you think stands out from your book. I mean, if you wanted your if you wanted our listeners to walk away from this podcast with one understanding, you know, one topic of understanding when it comes to um, intellectual property law and defense technology diffusion, what would it be? The law matters. Intellectual property law matters for how states protect themselves. It matters for how technology uh, migrates its way across the international system. And for too long, uh, especially in the field of international relations, we haven't paid attention to how much it matters. But it matters inside states and it matters between states. All right. Well, with that, thanks a lot for joining me. And uh, until next time, for listeners again, that was Robert Farley, contributor to The Diplomat, and he is author with David Isaacs of Patents for Power, Intellectual Property and the Diffusion of Military Technology, coming out later this year from the University of Chicago Press. Keep an eye out for the book. For listeners, if you've been a subscriber to the podcast but you haven't yet left us a review, we'd really appreciate if you could do that. It really helps get the word out about the show. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. We'd, uh, we'd love for you to keep up with uh, future coverage on, on this podcast. Finally, before we close, a quick note from our sponsor. This episode of the Asia Geopolitics Podcast is brought to you by Diplomat Risk Intelligence, or DRI. DRI is the Consulting and Analysis Division of The Diplomat, the Asia-Pacific's leading current affairs magazine. Since its launch in 2002, The Diplomat has been dedicated to quality analysis and commentary on events and trends in Asia and around the world, and is now one of the most respected publications covering the region. DRI inherits this approach and offers clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors worldwide access to an exclusive network of subject matter experts and analysts. Whatever your needs in the wider Asia-Pacific region, DRI can offer the knowledge and expertise necessary to anticipate and manage geopolitical and geoeconomic risks. For more information, please visit dri.thediplomat.com. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back soon with more.